There we go. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the third of the tabletop workshop uh, sessions at FDG. This is now the third FDG that I have been to, and it's the third one of these uh, sessions. So some coincidence there, other than uh, probably my joining for the last two of these. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Joseph Brown. I'm a professor at Annapolis University. And the co-host with me today is Hamna Islam. Hamna? Hi. Um, my name is Hamna, and um, I'm an instructor and final year PhD student at Annapolis University. Wonderful. So the uh, session today, we had a number of really great submissions. This is kind of the culmination of that. I also want to thank uh, the University of Malta that is right now helping us on the technical side and the, the work on this side, and also our general uh, chairs who are both, I think, in the meeting as well, Antonius and uh, Georges, who are, are joining us today for all of their hard work. So even with all of what's been going on with the uh, COVID issues, we've been working uh, in tight, uh, tight quarters and at home, and communicating with each other to have this happen. Uh, I'd also like to thank our uh, keynote and speaker today, who's joining us from uh, its quick, uh, Quillsilver, sorry, not quick, Quicksilver, but Quillsilver. Uh, and I met Brenna, I think due to this, uh, the FTG workshops, because I was doing some work on, uh, uh, a set of dice that she had done some marketing and some development uh, upon for uh, uh, one of their sets, the, I think it was the wizard set of dice that she was doing some, some work on. And she contacted me and we've been kind of discussing about tabletop games for quite a while. And I've asked her kindly to join us today. She has great experience within, especially the Kickstarter development of board games. And I think we can all kind of learn from her industry experience. And I think it's a good idea that we have these types of industry uh, partners going forward. So I think I'll, I'll pass the microphone over to her uh, virtually and let her introduce herself and her topic for today's uh, keynote. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Joey, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Uh, I'm Brennan Noonan. I am a board game developer, marketer, producer, general industry creator, um, and I'm also the co-founder of a company called Quillsilver Studio that provides creative services in the tabletop game industry. Um, so I did prepare a talk for y'all today, which I have a slideshow for. So let me um, hopefully present that. This is my first time presenting a slideshow on Zoom, so I appreciate you bearing with me. <laughs> okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> Um, so today I want to talk to you about board games as a Gesamtkunstwerk. Um, that's a really big German word. I sincerely apologize to any Germans who are listening. I will probably butcher a few German words in the course of this talk. Um, so what is a Gesamtkunstwerk? Uh, this is a German word, uh, which means a total artwork, an art artistic creation. Um, it was popularized by the German composer Richard Wagner. Um, and it's meant to synthesize all the elements of a musical work. Um, Wagner primarily wrote operas, um, so in his case, this would have been the synthesis of the music, drama, production, costume, staging, um, the libretto, which is the text of an opera. Um, so Richard Wagner was a romantic uh, German composer. And this philosophy of the Gestalt Kunstwerk basically culminated in what's uh, considered to be his masterwork, which is uh, Der Ring der Nibelungen, also known as the Ring Cycle. This is a four-part opera cycle, um, sung in German, um, very famous piece of uh, music in the classical, classical music world. Um, and this was basically the like, zenith of uh, his philosophy of the Gesamtkunstwerk. Um, he worked on this cycle for a couple decades, obviously wrote all the music, wrote the libretto, which is the text, uh, was very involved with the staging, the production itself. And 
his idea of the Gesamt Kunstwerk was a reaction against uh, the Parisian Grand Opera of the time, which he saw as overly verbose, um, too removed from the musical content, um, like too much spectacle and not enough art, basically. Um, so this was kind of his answer to that was create to create a fully synthesized piece of artwork. Um, now, how does that relate to board games, which is why I care and why you should too. Um, so before I worked in the board game industry, I was actually a uh, classical musician. I have a master's degree in classical music composition. And um, this has really informed how I've gone on to approach um, board game design and board game creation. Um, and even in my musical days, I was heavily influenced by Wagner's ideas of the Gesamtkunstwerk, um, this idea of like a holistic, to like totalitative creation process was um, really intriguing to me, um, especially because I was a composer and a performer, so I was often composing works for myself. So I had that kind of bottom-up view of um, what I was creating, and I was interested in synthesizing both sides of the creation process and the performance process. So this has um, influenced how I view board games um, through three primary lenses. Um, so the first of these is form. So viewing board game play experiences as a formal structure. Um, in music, when we talk about form, we're talking about basically the macro view of a piece of music. Um, so we're talking about rising and falling action, um, movements within a piece, how the piece makes you feel in a whole, um, the different experiences that you go through as you listen um, to the music. And obviously those things relate to board games as well. Um, board games can certainly ramp up in action, they can ramp down, you go through different emotions as you play them, quite a wide range of emotions. Um, so this is really in, uh, informed how I think about board games as having a formal structure. Um, second is harmony, finding resonant experiences within that structure. Um, in the context of music, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, resonant pinch pitches that relate to each other in space. Um, but we can also have resonant experiences in gameplay. Um, so these are experiences that relate to each other, things that feel good. Um, I think this is most easily demonstrated like with engine building games, um, when you are comboing out, um, getting all kinds of, synth synth um, excuse me, um, synthesized experiences happening at the same time. This is a resonant harmonic experience in board gameplay, I think. Um, the third one is mechanics, uh, which is manipulating known functions in pursuit of a desired outcome. So in music, um, this could be working with a set of pitches, working within a um, set form or structure. Um, it's basically, we know that X does Y. So we want to get some kind of desired experience out of what we're doing. Um, in music, we have things called cadences, which are basically um, harmonic progressions that cap off a phrase of music. They're very common. Um, you would certainly recognize them if you heard them, um, but they, we use them to basically signal to the viewer what's about to happen. We signal them the mood of the piece, if the piece is ending, um, if the piece is ramping up in um, activity, and we can use all those things in board games as well uh, through mechanics to signal to the viewer how the game is going to progress. Um, I want to talk about this concept of the Gesamtkunstwerk in practice um, through the lens of one board game that I was involved with creating, which is Everdell. Um, Everdell is, was released in 2018. It was funded on Kickstarter. Um, it's a worker placement engine building game. I have a list of credits up on the screen here. Um, so as you can see, this was a fairly like small team of people who created this game, pretty tight team. Um, and most of us were working on this game for several years um, and kind of directing the vision of the game and what we wanted it to be. And as we were working on it, um, we very much had this idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk in place, that we wanted this to be like a very holistic gameplay experience where all these different disparate elements of the game were uniting. Um, and Everdell is a success story. In the tabletop industry, it's considered a hit. Um, it raised it and its expansions have raised over 2 million on Kickstarter and many more through distribution. It's been translated into 10 languages, um, over 25,000 copies sold on Kickstarter and many, many more through distribution as well. Winner of multiple year-end awards and it is currently uh, the number 40 um, most popular game on Board Game Geek. Um, so quite a highly regarded game, which is why I thought um, it would be a good choice to kind of demonstrate this philosophy of the Gesamtkunstwerk to show 
that it, uh, it can actually work in practice and be quite successful. Um, it's not just pontificating. Um, so on the right here, you can see some of the original cards in Everdell. So when Everdell came to us as a prototype, uh, this is what we saw. And immediately what we wanted to do was retheme the game. Um, so it starts with the theme. So when Everdell came to us, it had a very generic theme, um, like medieval fantasy. And the first question we asked ourselves was, how can this theme be more exciting? Next question, how can this theme be more on trend? Um, it's easy to think about board games in a vacuum, but at the end of the day, for most of us, these are products that actually have to be sold and they have to stand on their own two feet in the marketplace. Um, so we need the theme to be on trend. And also, how can this theme be more accessible? How can it relate more broadly? How can it bring more people in? Um, these may not be the goals for every game. Um, some games are a little bit more niche. They don't need to consider these things, but for our intents and purposes for Everdell, um, making a hobby game, this was definitely uh, what we were thinking about. So Everdell, um, for those of you who don't know, has a woodland critter theme. Um, so you are playing as cute little critters that are running around the forest and you're trying to gather resources and build a city before uh, winter comes, basically. Um, so the game is played over the course of four seasons and once you get to winter, the game ends. Um, so like I said, original cards on the right there. So that's what we had to go off of when we um, originally evaluated Everdell for publication. Uh, so the medieval town to critters was the evolution of Everdell. So the first thing we knew we wanted was we wanted a novel theme. Um, at the time, uh, like I said, Everdell was published in 2018, so we were working on it in like 2016. Um, at the time, there was an abundance of games with darker, kind of grimmer themes, and we really wanted to kind of have a conscious reaction against that. Um, so we wanted to offer people an alternative to darker, grittier themes, and also an alternative to drier Euro themes. Um, so we wanted something that was really rich, but also really accessible. Um, so that's what we ultimately landed on with the Woodland Critters. And keeping with the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the theme and the gameplay need to always be entwined because over the course of development, the theme is going to change to better improve and reflect the gameplay. And likewise, the gameplay is going to change to better reflect the theme. So over the course of development, um, some of those cards you saw on the last screen, those may have been renamed, rethemed, got new abilities, because over the course of the game, we're thinking, all right, what would a squirrel be doing in this situation? Well, they wouldn't be going to a cemetery, for example, um, but maybe we can have like an undertaker go to the cemetery. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, so those things are always informing each other throughout the course of gameplay. Um, and what this does is it creates a positive feedback loop and it continues to improve the theme and the mechanics as those are both feeding into each other over the course of development. Um, presentation, one of the things that people first notice about Everdell is it has a lot of table presence. Um, Everdell has a large circular die cut board. Um, it also has a large cardboard tree that sticks up in the middle of it. Um, so it's, it's eye-catching when you walk around a convention hall and you see somebody playing Everdell, there's always like a group of people around their table because people want to know what the game is. Um, that was really important to us. Um, so we were thinking at very early stages, how do we want this game to look and designing from the ground up um, to make sure that the uh, presentation of the game held up when it, come to the, when it came to the gameplay itself and that they informed each other. Um, how does the game feel? This is not just experientially, but also physically, ergonomically. How do the components feel to hold? How easy is it to reach all the components? How easy it is to read all the cards? How easy it is to discern what's going on on the board? Um, those are all things that we're very much considering. And then what experience that does this game elicit? Um, and that can, the experience comes from a lot of different places. It can certainly come from the mechanics in the form of the game, which I talked about earlier, um, but can, it can also come from the presentation of the game. Um, Everdell has a very like light, whimsical art style, but it's also realistic. It's not cartoony. Um, so we wanted to really like draw people into this world that felt very light and welcoming and friendly, but not childlike, um, which is kind of a tricky needle to thread. Familiarity and novelty. 
So these are um, two ideas that are really important when you are theming a game and when a game starts to become not just a design, but an actual product. Um, so Everdell borrows mechanics and structures of existing games. Um, the mechanics in Everdell are not particularly innovative in and of themselves, but they're combined in very innovative ways. Um, for example, like worker placement games have been around forever. So saying, oh, Everdell is a worker placement game isn't particularly innovative, but the way it uses worker placement is interesting. Um, this kind of relates back to music because we, in, at least in Western music, um, tend to use the same 12 pitches, we use the same scales. So if you're changing genres or playing an unfamiliar piece, if you have that knowledge of the musical system that we're using in the West, the musical canon, then you have a stepping stone to go off of, like you have a strong foundation. So that was important to us because we wanted people to be able to get into Everdell easily. We didn't want it to be difficult to learn, to get to the table. Um, we wanted it to be kind of like on the gateway plus level. Um, so we wanted to make sure that people were able to easily grasp the mechanics of the game. And then the excitement comes from seeing those mechanics that they know applied in new ways, but they don't need to learn a whole new alien mechanic to them. Um, since we were able to be familiar with the mechanics, that freed us up to be innovative in other ways. Um, so one of the ways we were able to do that was with the quality and uniqueness of the components. So on the left side of the screen here, um, these are the berries in Everdome, which are rubber and they're actually like squishy. They feel like real berries. At the time, um, I've seen this done a few times since then, but um, that was quite an innovative component at the time, a couple of years ago. Um, the industry moves very fast, but things that happened a couple of years ago are, you know, it was innovative then, but not anymore. <laughs> um, but so because we were able to be a little bit more familiar with the mechanics, when it came to the presentation, we felt more comfortable pushing the envelope and giving people things that were a little bit more unfamiliar, a little bit more exciting. Um, I mentioned the tree at the start. Um, I don't know if I have a photo of it, but it's a large tree that sticks up in the middle of the table. Um, and that allowed us to explore um, the vertical space of the game area. So we, t we think about horizontal space a lot. We talk about games being table hogs that take up your entire table. Um, but vertical space is very underexplored in board games. Um, so we really wanted to basically extend the board upward. Um, this allowed us to make it even more accessible because if people don't have a huge play space, they can't sprawl out a huge board, uh, we build it vertically so they can still have this like an experience that feels very big and grand but can be played much more easily than some of these massive sprawling games. Um, it's also a setting that invites imagination, but doesn't require a whole lot of buy-in. Um, Everdell is definitely its own world, but you don't need to read a lore book to understand the world. Um, instead, Everdell invites you to imprint on it and make your own kind of imaginative extensions of the world. Um, you can certainly dream up little stories about the characters in Everdell, think about what their lives could be like, but it's not necessary to play the game and still feel like you're living in that world while you're playing. Um, it's also not overly demanding in terms of the learning curve, the time required, or the complexity. That was really important to us um, just in terms of who we felt this game was for, who the audience was. Um, because we were working with more familiar mechanics, we knew that this was going to be um, that gateway plus kind of weight of game, midway game. Um, so we really wanted it to be something that people could easily get to the table, um, play with any group, and they would have a good time. Um, the concept of ease was really recurring throughout the development of Everdell. Um, we wanted it to just feel like a very easy experience, and I don't mean that in terms of easy to win, but just a general sense of ease about it. We didn't want it to be a stressful experience. We wanted this to just be a really overwhelmingly pleasant experience for the, the people playing. Um, I already talked about the table presence a little bit with the vertical space of the tree. And then um, just something that we think about a lot um, is the aesthetic value of the game. Um, so I definitely think of board games as essentially being art objects. I have um, a lot of games on my shelf that I haven't played <laughs> and may never play, but I'm kind of okay with that because I think that just the fact that they exist as they are as artistic objects justifies their existence. Um, 
a game is a game, even if it's not being played, and it's still valuable, even if it's not being played. Um, so we wanted people to not just feel that Everdell was another game sitting on their shelf, that it was an art object sitting on their shelf, that it was something beautiful that would make them feel good, even if they weren't actually playing it, just by virtue of having it, it would make them feel good. Then there's the idea of the complete product. And I'm just going to grab a sip of water. Excuse me. So like I said at the beginning, we're not creating games in a vacuum, usually. Um, we're creating games that are going to hopefully be successful products. So when we're thinking about how we're going to market and sell a game, first thing we have to ask is, who is this game for? Where is our audience? Um, what platforms are they on? And who is playing games right now? So with Everdell, we knew that we wanted this game to be for people who um, may be already be hobbyist gamers. Oh, sorry, too fast. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, we knew that these were people who may already be hobbyist gamers, but they may also be new gamers, gateway gamers, um, and more importantly, a game that hobbyist gamers could play with their families and friends and gaming groups and less experienced gamers. So we wanted it to kind of serve as a bridge between all these different gaming groups. So we want it to be really, really highly access um, accessible. So our marketing efforts were really involved with um, kind of conveying, again, that sense of ease, that really welcoming sense uh, with the presentation of the game. Um, all of our marketing materials were like very light and airy and just really wanting to bring people into the world and trying to show people how pleasant it could be to just live and play in the world of Everdell for a while. Um, it was, like I said, a reaction against some of these darker, more serious themes. Um, we definitely kind of played that up at the time. Uh, there were just so many of those games coming out that we wanted people to feel like this was a breath of fresh air if um, what was currently on the market wasn't to their taste. It was like, oh, finally, a game for me. <laughs> um, so that was definitely our strategy with it. Um, like I said at the beginning, Everdell did go to Kickstarter. Um, so being um, a Kickstarter game, we identified a lot of areas in the game that we could kind of reserve or hold back for stretch goals, for expansions, um, we wanted the game to be able to be built on and for the community to have that sense of investment in it that they were helping to make the game better. Um, even though these were things that we had identified and things that we kind of knew that we wanted to be in the game, when you can kind of parcel them out and reveal them over the course of the Kickstarter, it really um, improves like the sense of community buy-in that they get to the game and they feel like, oh, I had a hand in putting those metal coins in the game. Um, that's something that's, that's really effective. Um, when it came to the expansions, again, since we were able to be um, a little bit more on the familiar side with the mechanics, um, we were able to stretch mechanically a little bit more with the expansions um, because people had such like a comfortable foundation with the game. We felt pretty sure that they would have an easier time stretching to new mechanics um, as opposed if they were just immediately thrown into the deep end with the base game. Um, so particularly with one of the expansions, which is called Spirecrest, um, which really ramps up the difficulty and complexity of the game. Um, I don't, I wouldn't have felt as comfortable doing that if, it, if the base game was more um, like alienating possibly or demanded a higher um, investment just to learn it. But because it's a fairly easy buy-in for most gamers, uh, we felt pretty comfortable pushing that envelope a little bit more with the expansion material. Uh, so basically my conclusion with this is that cohesive creative vision um, leads to a superior experience and product. When you start the game creation process with that bottom up or top down, <laughs> which however you want to think about it, vision in mind, thinking about a holistic game creation experience, thinking about how your theme relates to your mechanics, relates to your presentation, relates to your production, relates to your marketing, um, how the ergonomics of the game are going to feel, how it's going to feel in your hands, how it's going to occupy physical space. If you can start thinking about those things from way earlier on in the process, it's going to result in a much stronger, better game and product at the end. 
um, because it's going to unite all these disparate elements that go into creating the game. Um, this is kind of a personal philosophy of mine. So what I've since done um, in the wake of Everdell is actually created my own company, uh, Quillsilver Studio, where we create tabletop products using this philosophy. Um, so we usually work with designers or publishers that bring us a raw design and basically say, you know, finish it, turn it into a product. Um, so we develop the game, we art direct it, illustrate it, do all the graphic design, put it through production, figure out how to market it, and then we go back to the original game creator and say, okay, it's a product, it's ready to go. Um, and keeping that whole process in-house under one roof with one small cohesive team is all on the page, all on the same page is I think the best way to um, create board games because I think you can kind of tell when there is friction between parts of a game um, where the theme feels pasted on, it doesn't really fit with the mechanics. Um, if the presentation of the game is subpar, if you know the, the mechanics may be really great, but down the graphic design is poor, it's made with cheap cardstock, um, all those things can just really dampen the experience of playing a game. Um, so at Quillsilver, we try to create games in this Gaston Kunstwerk philosophy, this total work of art, um, where we, um, from the outset, are thinking of all these things from the beginning. And from that first time we play the game, we're thinking about how is this going to translate to a finished product? How is this going to look on the table two years down the road? That's me. Thank you so much for having me. This is um, my information on the, on the screen here. Okay, so thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, so on Zoom, we've got this thing, it's under the uh, participants uh, tab that allows you to kind of mark out. So if there's any questions, then I can go through and uh, look for those that have a, a marker under them. Yeah, ask. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, and then I can just unset the, the mutes on there. So just let me know if anyone has any questions. Or if even if you want to type them in the chat, if you're embarrassed to talk on camera, then I can also relay them to the speaker. Um, I, I would like to say one of the things that I found very interesting about the presentation was the comments on taking into account the space that people don't have, you know, the large amounts of space in order to put out a huge game and that you worked with that vertically. And so I was wondering if you had any more comments about that. Oh, who muted you? There we go. That should. There we go. I'm back. There. <laughs> yeah, it, it's tricky. Um, and it kind of, it, it's hard not to feel like you're, um, you know, always being the bad guy and like bringing a designer down when you kind of have to bring them back down to earth and talk about kind of mundane things like table size. Um, but it is absolutely a consideration. Um, like I keep saying, at the end of the day, we're making, most of us are making products that we want to sell. Um, so we do have to take things like ergonomics and physical space into account. Um, we have to account for the size of the box and like, will it fit on a calyx shelf? Most people use calyx shelves. So that's something that we definitely take in mind, take into account. Um, when it came to the vertical space, interestingly, um, the tree in Everdell is probably the most polarizing part of the game. Um, people tend to really love it or really hate it. Um, and a lot of people say, you know, oh, why, why is the tree even in there? It's not necessary to use in the game. I don't want to use it. Um, and that's true, it's not necessary. It has a function in the game, but you can easily play without it. Um, but for us, uh, we just had a different perspective on it, that it doesn't need to have a, um, a, a necessity in terms of the gameplay to still be a valid addition to the game. Um, for us, the aesthetics are just as important as the gameplay. So for us, just the fact that it looks beautiful on the table justifies its inclusion in the game, even if it doesn't have a pure mechanical value. Um, 
so just thinking about that in terms of that vertical space, it's just thinking about how else can we innovate with the space that we have? Um, what is going to feel innovative to, um, to the player? And how else can we kind of keep building with the space that we have without being overwhelming or blowing out our budget or things like that? I, I think I saw a hand up from Rodrigo. So I'll ask him to unmute. Yeah, uh, I actually, hi, uh, I'm Rodrigo. Hi. So my question was also about the, the verticality aspect. And uh, so it was partially answered by, by, the, by Joseph's uh, also question. But I wonder, like you, you did mention that the tree plays a role functionally as well. So I, I, I want, having never played the game and I'm like, I'm dying to try it now. Uh, can you explain what, ha what type of gameplay happens in the tree? And if there was any kind of decisions like, this should happen down here, this should happen, happen up here so that they have like different game fields or something like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the upper branches, so the construction of the tree, it's a cardboard tree. Um, it has a couple layers of branches and then the, the trunk is hollow. Um, so the deck of cards that you draw from sits in the hollow of the tree. And then the upper branches of the tree holds um, these types of cards called event cards that are basically like end game um, scoring goal cards that you try to get at the end of the game for extra points. Um, so putting them up in the upper eaves of the tree was definitely a gameplay decision um, because they're not really um, a, like a factor for the first several rounds of the game. They don't come into play until the end. Um, so getting them up off the board was just kind of a no-brainer. Um, it's also where the extra workers uh, are placed. So in terms of necessity, um, you certainly don't need to do that. You can rest them on the table just fine, um, but it does clear more space on the board to get them up off there. Um, and kind of philosophically, it's like this lofty goal that you want at the end of the game, uh, like a physically lofty goal. Um, and, uh, and yeah, likewise with the deck, um, that doesn't need to be in the hollow, it could just sit on the board. Um, so the tree does have a, a function. It's not a necessary function though. You can easily play without it. Um, I find that it makes for like a more complete experience to have that on the board though. And so you're, you're in here right now with a bunch of primarily academics on games. And I mean, we've kind of talked about this briefly, you and I, about what, what should academics and big games be looking at? from the industry perspective? What do you see as our role within the, within the communications? Yeah, I mean, there, there's honestly so many, so many areas where more research is so sorely needed. Um, like the big questions that I always come back to are kind of the marketing related questions, like who's buying games, where are they buying them? Which platforms are they using? How much are they spending? Um, more research on that is sorely needed, I think. Um, I could be getting some of these numbers wrong, so I apologize, but just off the top of my head, um, I mean, I know that hobby games alone are like a $2 billion industry, and that doesn't include things like Monopoly and chess, which are many, many more billions of dollars. Um, so it's a huge industry that unfortunately a lot of the participants in the industry don't actually have great data about and how to like most lucratively participate in the industry. Um, so I would personally love some more data on that. I'd also love um, kind of better categorizations of, of games, um, of genre and mechanics. Um, I think the way that we talk about and categorize games can be a little bit limiting. And like, I know I've even used some of that language in this talk because it's like convenient nomenclature in the industry. Um, but when we talk about a game being like a worker placement game, um, that is in some regards a useful identifier at a very basic level. Um, defining like a basic mechanic is a common factor between many games, um, but it doesn't actually really convey anything about like the game complexity, the game length, um, the game like presentation doesn't convey any of that. Um, so I wish that we had like deeper categorization levels um, to better group games. Okay, so something more like a taxonomy and a few more yeah. identifiers there. Yeah. Okay, so I know and Antonius 
couldn't get his hand up. I'm assuming probably because he's in charge, so he can't put up <laughs> his hand for something that he has control over. So I can give thumbs up, but not not that. Okay. <laughs> um, I, it was really interesting talk. I um, I really enjoyed the part about the physical aspects and how they actually tell you more about not only you know this is a berry, but it's also this is a chill game um, that is less about you know competition, Euro style, etc. I want to turn the your design thought process, let's say, on its head. So let's assume you're making a gritty game. Could you actually do that? So, or, or are gritty, you know, war games to solve problems? We don't really care about that. I just wanted your opinion. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the games that we made after Everdell was actually called A War of Whispers, which is um, kind of like a lightweight war game. Um, yeah, so, so all those factors would definitely still still come into play for sure. Um, that I, I'd say the strategy is the same, just the specifics would be a little bit different. Um, so instead of conveying this like air of ease with, that we did with Everdell um, with this game, A War of Whispers, we were trying to convey a sense of like dread, sneaking suspicion, anxiety. <laughs> um, it was a def definitely a different atmosphere that we were trying to um, elicit from from the gamer. Um, so yeah, that would absolutely, absolutely still apply. Um, this system definitely works with games of all genres, definitely. And um, like the ergonomics, like the physicality that you mentioned, would definitely still be the same, um, like those core ideas from game to game, regardless of the genre or the mechanics. Um, at the end of the day, we want um, games to not fight the player, basically. We don't I think even with a gritty game, you wouldn't want it to be like a confrontational experience, at least not between the game and the player itself. Um, obviously, there may be some exceptions to this with like certain purely solo games. But what I'm trying to get at is, and it's very simple ideas, but a lot of people overlook it. Like we want components to be easy to pick up. We want cards to be easy to read. Um, it's such a struggle for people to even like get games to the table that we don't want to put any more barriers in front of that. Um, like people, one thing that people ask that I think kind of conveys a misunderstanding here is um, like how, as, as a board gamer, how do you compete with video games? And I honestly don't think that we're competing with video games. I think what we're competing for is time. So anything that I can do to cut down on the time that is needed for somebody to get involved in a game um, is like a no brainer to me. Um, so because of that, I do tend to focus on um, games that are more in the like 30 to two hour, like two hour would be an upper limit range. Um, I'm not really like working on any like, huge sprawling games right now. Um, I love a lot of those games and I think they're definitely valid, but I think with the way that our market is trending and I wish that we had more data on it so I could be sure, so <laughs> take note, um, that we're just going to see that those huge games get harder and harder to play. Um, and those really expansive sprawling games get harder and harder to get to the table. Um, so I kind of think that's where the market is going to go, um, a slightly more abbreviated experience, um, not like party games necessarily, but just that kind of sweet spot of like 60 minutes, um, I think is going to continue to be a really big part of the market. Um, I think I got a little bit off track there, but <laughs> I hope that answered your question. Hamna, you had a question? Yeah, I do have. Vrena, thank you for the presentation and thank you for sharing details of a very good work. So um, I'm interested to know that um, as you were saying that the game is not heavy in terms of learning curve, so I would like to know how do you quantify this information? Like, do you have some metric system? Like if the players are doing this, 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 without much help, it means the game is like very light on their minds or do you just get general feedback from them and then try to analyze this information? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think complexity can be viewed on a lot of different scales. Um, so one thing with Everdell is that on a macro level, it's really not very complex. Um, on your turn, you have two actions um, that you can take. You can either place a worker or you can play a card. You cannot do anything else. Now within those two choices, there may be a, quite a wide variety of choices to make, but you know when you start your turn, you have one big choice that you're gonna make and it's either gonna be place a worker or, or play a card. 
So what that does is it removes so much of the mental load from the player. Um, so that is, I think, probably the single biggest um, kind of step forward to making the game accessible. Um, with Everdell specifically, some of the games that it borrows mechanics from um, are just games that are kind of more established, like in the board game canon, that a lot of hobbyist board gamers would have played, um, like Agricola or Race for the Galaxy. Um, so if players have played those games, a lot of um, what's in Everdell would feel pretty familiar um, and accessible to them. Thank you very much. So any other questions for guests today? Brenna, I wanna really thank you for, for coming and doing this because I know that this is a little bit outside of your, your norm. Oh no, it was great. Thank you so much for having me. And I, you were also a great help with uh, the reviews of, of this. And so hopefully you will come back and, and join us again and, and chat some more with us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was um, you know, a pleasure to read, to read all the papers and congratulations to everybody who was accepted. It was really impressive, um, really cool work. Um, hopefully we can all get together in person next time. Yes, so hope, hopefully FDG 2021 will have you in person. Uh, I don't know, Antonius, do you have any ideas on where we're headed to next year? Let's wait until the end of the conference to find out. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's the big, the big reveal comes at the end. And I think between Antonius and, and myself, we'll, we'll try to make sure that this happens again next year. Uh, you know, it, it almost didn't happen this year, but we, we worked together and figured it out. So once again, um, I think Chris is right now moving to his other room for to start the presentations and for the presentations of the paper and the remainder of the session I get to hand off to my graduate student because that's what professors do is we we st we start off the thing and then we just hand all the actual work to the graduate students isn't that right Hannah yeah okay um, and so the other piece that I would really like to do, uh, and I think we'll get a bit of time today to do it, is I'd like us to have a bit of an ideas session as a group and just talk about what some of the challenges are inside of academics for games. Brenna had some great ideas there, especially with like market understanding and that. So maybe somebody can answer that question going forward. So if anyone has ideas on that, start thinking about it and we'll open up the room uh, and unmute everybody and have a bit of an ideas session coming up. But right now I will hand off to Hamna, who will okay. introduce, I guess, our first speaker. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, there's a little bit of a change of the plan. Louis was supposed to present first, but um, because of some technical reasons, we have Christopher presenting. So Christopher will, uh, will be talking about his research work, The Making of La Mancha, Games as Literary Criticism. And Christopher, are you ready? I think I need to ask you to unmute. He might be moving to the other room. Yeah. And actually, we need to unmute him too. I've, I've hit the ask to unmute, so we're just waiting on it. Okay, so in the, in the meantime, maybe what I can probably do is get started, uh, maybe a Google Doc or something, and then we can kind of just put some ideas up there for the ideas session that's going to be coming up. Sure.
Hello. Hi. Uh, oh, where are we starting right now? Yeah, Christopher, are you ready? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was, I had to step away from my computer for a second. Um, <laughs> Yeah, let me... Sorry, my one-year-old was wandering through. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, let me do, do, do. Let me turn on the slideshow. And do, do, do. screen share. And I will. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Okay, um, and then I'm going to also Oh, I okay. Well, I will unmute my camera in a second. So, um Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to see my talk on my uh, tabletop game, La Mancha. Uh, and thank you for uh, the organizers for letting me give this postmortem of my game uh, and how we use game design as a method of embodying elements of literary analysis. So for those who don't know me, um, I'm Chris Totten. I teach at Kent State University in Ohio in the United States. Uh, I'm a game developer who's worked on both commercial and serious games titles. I'm also an author and a co-founder of uh, several art museum-based game festivals, such as the Smithsonian American Art Museum Arcade and Game Fest Akron, which is a, a local to me area game festival. So today what I want to talk to you about is my uh, Don Quixote themed storytelling game La Mancha, how it came to be, and how I used principles uh, derived from my you know, background in architectural design to make it, and whether any of this was actually successful. So uh, for those who haven't seen it, uh, La Mancha is a storytelling card game for three to five players where everyone takes on the role of chivalrous knights trying to be the most renowned in the land. So to do so, you respond to story prompts uh, from the novel using car, uh, cards with quotes from real books of chivalry. Throughout the game, you also recite love poetry to other players and battle great monsters like giants, which may or may uh, not also be windmills. Uh, oh, did I lose everybody? Uh-oh. Uh, we can hear you and we can see the screen. Okay. Also. Sorry, my Zoom thing like cut away. That's very strange. So if you're unfamiliar with Don Quixote, it's a novel published in Spain in 1605 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Uh, it's considered by many to be the first modern novel and an important piece of world literature. Uh, it's had an important cultural impact, showing up in art, theater, as a cursed movie, as comics, as postmodernism, uh, as sketches on Sesame Street, and even in uh, as a boss in cool indie games that I like, among other things. Uh, so Don Quixote is a very large book, uh, so it's it's about uh, 863 pages, and upon reading it, my game designer brain wanted to make something that entice non-readers to take up the book. And, uh, you know, if people had read the book, to explore the themes through gameplay. So as a video game developer, I also wanted uh, to, I had some goals about wanting to learn to self-publish tabletop games. So, you know, there's some commercial aspects of my goals with this project as well. Uh, like I said before, my background's in architecture. So I generally approach projects with methods from that discipline. While this usually manifests as using spatial organization principles and things like you know, video game level and environment design, I've been very interested lately in the mental processes that designers in uh, classical arts and design fields use to organize seemingly disparate elements of projects into cohesive works. So you know, the, the uh, you know, keynote 
for example, was very interesting to me because I, I like to think of these works as all inclusive works of art. Um, so I think the same way about games. For an architect, this might mean, you know, addressing site conditions and structural loads and client wishes and references to architectural context. But for games, you know, we can do the same with some of the concepts that we are, uh, that I'm going to cover today. So uh, first I'm going to start from a top-down perspective and start with mechanics, which is, you know, very typical game developer uh, place to start. But to work with Don Quixote, I sat down and wrote out what were some of the actions that I saw heavily throughout the book. So while everyone remembers the scene where Don Quixote attacks windmills, much of the story is actually based on characters telling one another stories about their life or, you know, fictional stories they've come up with. So there's a heavy aspect of storytelling, um, but also there's an element of Don Quixote himself quoting lines from his favorite books of chivalry. So I was like, well, what can be that, that core mechanism? Uh, and there was some discussion of social card games. I've been playing a lot of them with my friends, so I thought something like the metagame or apples to apples uh, might be very nice. So I started with gameplay mechanics based on that model, but built in a Don Quixote fashion. So what I did is I delved into the source material of Don Quixote and you know, pulled out quotes from the books of chivalry that he himself was quoting in the book. Uh, and that became response cards. Oh, there's everybody again, hello. Uh, that became response cards for the game. Similar to, again, an apples to apples or metagame type. So in this way, fun interactions could be had as players yelled the names of famous knights or invoked phrases like Julius Caesar's ashes uh, as, they, as they told one another stories. Uh, so this metagame callout, though, gives us a segue into the next design concept, which is precedent studies. And as a game developer, I can say that, you know, in my previous work in architecture and graphic design, um, precedent studies was very common. You'd look at works that came before as just part of, you know, your normal activity. But game developers have a really weird relationship with, with uh, precedence and originality because you either have games that lean super heavily into their influences uh, to the point of, you know, slavish fan person um, type reaction, or you have people who get really upset if there's anything that looks vaguely like anything else. Uh, so, you know, lots of angry comments on the internet about that. But precedent studies and references are really common in other fields of design. Uh, you might be influenced by that work's style, or the work might deal with similar issues as your work. So you look at previous works so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, essentially. Requiring a precedent study or analytique drawing is common assignment in other schools of design. Uh, and then architect and game designer, uh, game design writer Sarah Bonser even points out that a series of uh, works that share precedence is how you would get what are called zeitgeists in, in, art, in uh, other art fields. Game designers Chris Lothorpe and Sean Taylor even liken the precedent process to the common musical practice of sampling. So, you know, working with influences from other games is kind of sampling and remixing. So for La Mancha, I used precedence. Uh, I played literary tabletop games like Moby Dick or Dune to see how they address stories that they were based on. Obviously, there were more than just these, but for the sake of the talk, um, I'm just going to stick to to this stuff since um, you know it's a it's a shorter talk. But you know, here I saw that creating the systems of the book created a better game experience than trying to just reenact the book. Uh, if anybody's played either of these, you'll know that Moby Dick, it, it has points where you kind of say, you know, okay, stop. Now we are going to have this part of the story. Whereas Dune is much more open and you're, you're more in the world of Dune than you are, you know, saying, all right, everybody stop. Um, I don't want to say plot points because there's a movie coming out soon. So that, I don't want to ruin it for anybody. But, you know, you don't stop and, and reenact parts of the plot in that game. 
I also saw that players thought about the story more and engaged the literary material when you got them talking to each other. So again, Moby Dick, and I, I'm, you know, pointing out ways that it has shortcomings, but I love this game uh, regardless. But it has you play in sort of parallel, so you're on the Pequod, but you don't really talk to each other. Whereas in Dune, you can directly interact, wheel and deal with each other, and betray each other. So there's a lot more engagement with the material in that way, and it gets you to think about the, the novel much more. And, and this bears out in work like that from uh, game designer Jason Morningstar, who describes the fruitful void of space between players of a game uh, that can be filled with meaningful discussion. So his point is, don't just design the game, try to design the social space around your game so that, you know, that becomes the game itself is, you know, your game facilitates the social experience that you create. And then in Stott and Newstetter's elements of successful classroom games, you know, so how do you get games, uh, people playing games to absorb material? Uh, those emphasize socialization and storytelling. So that's, that became a big goal of, of La Mancha. Uh, so ideas learned from these precedents became, like I said, part of La Mancha. Uh, the game should not be a reenactment of the novel, but put you in the novel's world and give you the tools of the characters so you can forge your own path through La Mancha, the geographical region. So the players get to do their own sampling of elements. Um, I mentioned the chivalry cards before. So uh, the cards that came out of this exercise were a journey deck of story prompts that will give you scenarios from the novel to react to. So you get the story prompt, but you almost, through quoting chivalry like Don Quixote, uh, create your own ways out of the story. This is the experience that actually got a lot of people to say, wait, this is stuff in Don Quixote, I'll go buy a copy of the book now. So the last design me methodology uh, is architectural design thinking. And some of you may be thinking design thinking, that is, that is a scary buzzword. Well, that's true, but architects legitimately use it to describe both uh, user, blah, both user-based design and the act of organizing all the facets of a design product from the physical realities of, you know, a building to the contributions of like the other professionals they work with to make the building happen. If we were to, um, you know, a quote by a professor of mine points out that one of his favorite things about being an architect was learning about the work of other people and taking what happens during their day into the uh, into account as he was working so that he could make you know even down to micro interactions of his, their job better so i really like to think about that when i design games i want to think about how can we include micro elements into the game to make the moment to moment experience of the game better so uh, if we explore this idea a bit, we can see two points of view for understanding games that have useful applications. So the first is what you often see in, I think, you know, game studies, which is a single work theory. It sees games as a holistic work with interactivity as a defining element. And as powerful as I think that can be, I actually kind of want to break that up a little bit. Uh, you see this in game areas where games are applied to non-entertainment contexts, such as bringing games to classrooms, or as, you know, displayed as singular objects in art museums, like we have at the MoMA or at uh, SAM. But, you know, again, as somebody who is really interested in looking at works as, again, unified artworks, well, what are we unifying? Well, let's think about games maybe in a collected work theory model. It considers games as networks of individual artworks that combine to form interactive, meaningful experiences. This model acknowledges that disciplines required to make parts of games um, exist. I've, I've worked on teams where, you know, the artist, the musician, the programmer were really just seen as, you know, sort of contractors uh, only. They weren't really just, you know, just, just make my pretty pictures, okay? You know, I want to look at games down to what are the artistic visual influences 
coming from the fields of art or architecture or music um, that bring that come together to bring the game uh, to players. So, uh, you know, we're looking at individual ass, uh, assets, but the disciplines beyond those assets that made those ad assets um, that influence the game experience. So looking at the game from these two perspectives help make a richer system of analysis at both macro and micro scale. I already talked about the mechanics, the broad mechanics of La Mancha, but if we put, uh, if we drill down and uh, we look at the design and artwork of individual cards, we can see how suddenly we have a system of addressing like themes of literary criticism. Um, and I'm almost done, don't worry. So these cards, for example, make players think about uh, the form of the game and ask them to rewrite the game in the way that the novel makes meta statements about novels. These cards uh, explore how Don Quixote invents his own reality to challenge social class. Uh, and that's expressed not only in the mechanics, but also in the visual design of, say, for example, the Dulcinea card, which uses the optical illusion of the old woman and the young woman to express how Dulcinea may not even be real. And then uh, this kind of micro design let us make expansions and promotion cards like this one uh, that I distributed at GDC that depicts Chris Crawford's famous dragon speech from 1992 where he quit the industry by role playing as Don Quixote. So in terms of success, I'm happy to say uh, this game won some awards, uh, obviously not at a huge scale of the, uh, the game that we saw in the previous talk, but you know, it was successfully funded on Kickstarter. It won some, some uh, awards and it actually has had very good cross market attention, including uh, you know, with schools and libraries. So where does this research go from here? Um, beyond more deeply researching those processes, I'm also continuing to apply individual parts of game development as critical practices uh, my latest project, an example, is an indie game called Little Nemo and the Nightmare Fiends, based on a 1905 comic strip important in the history of animation. And we're using art direction as, a, as an interpretive practice. Uh, we are taking works that were influenced by this comic, we're taking the comic, looking at it through the lens of all the works that were influenced by it, and then bringing that back to create a new version of the comic. Um, so thank you for letting me present. Uh, I would love to chat and follow up after this. Um, here's the information. And if you want to get a copy of La Mancha, uh, there are some helpful web links. Thank you very much, Christopher. Yeah. So everybody, if you have any questions, please either just speak up or you can write in the chat. Somebody raised the hand, Henrik. And um, I don't know how to unmute you. Yeah, sorry, I'm like struggling with the uh, interface here. Yeah. Uh, I, I asked him to unmute. So uh -huh. should be able to... Henrik, are you there? He said he cannot for some reason. Henrik? He keeps, he keeps pressing the mute key. Yeah. No, I keep getting remuted for some reason. Uh, I wasn't actually touching the mute key, but hi. Hi there. Hey, so uh, Chris, I have a question about the uh, collected work theory. Yes. Or I, would, I would just like to hear you talk more about it because I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, actually, so that is the, uh, I guess, secret uh, point of the talk is really to start to, to plant that flag a bit. But, um, ah, there we go. Now there's the, there's the video controls. Um, so collected work theory is if, if we take the idea of, I guess some backstory, I've worked on a lot of game projects. My job is mainly as a level designer as a, and as a visual artist. And, you know, I've worked in the academic game development space for a number of years. So doing we cannot a hear you. You can't hear me. Oh, no, I, I, I can now hear you. we can, but <laughs> we missed some information. Okay. Uh, so let me, let me start over. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay. So I've been, uh, I've been working in, I guess, academic game development for a long time. And where did my controls go? Start video. 
hi. <laughs> so I've been working in academic game development for a long time, and I've worked in studios where um, I see Mike Sellers on the call. He and I have talked about this a few times. Um, where, you know, like I said, if if you are not the game mechanic designer, it's really just a question of like, you know, make the pictures, make this, make that. And I found this really weird discrepancy between, I guess, the industry and fan communities who will have like, if you go to GDC, there will be the art track talk, the programming talk, the AI talk, this and that. Um, if you go to say MAGFest, you'll see, I mean, that is, that is, video game music concerts, right? Um, but when you read a lot of game studies, it is like game, right? Game as singular object. And I, I you know, I, I've uh, seen a lot of people who are asset creators put a lot of work into their, into their assets and they are coming from very informed areas. But I see that those informed areas are kind of kept out of game discourse sometimes. So I think this is my way of trying to smash that up a little bit and be like, um, like I, you know, I don't know if anybody listens to the Game Study Study Buddies podcast. Uh, you should, it's excellent. But they talked about how um, by focusing on the ways that games are actually not special as, as media works, um, you know, we should think of them as special, but if we consider them to be like other media works and like pieces of literature that have influences from wide varied areas, um, then we can start to bring in those artistic uh, influences a little bit more and start to see the way that, you know, maybe uh, certain games were influenced by uh, visually by comics or, or uh, paintings or, you know, things like that. So that's, that's kind of where it started. Um, so it, it's basically, I'd like to see more of that in game discourse, but I didn't see a good, I guess, mindset that was allowing for that. So that's, that's the gist of it. Thank you. That was an excellent answer to the question. I oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Christopher. Is there anyone else? Okay, um, I would like to ask something too. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, just some time back, I was trying to play test um, a game and I was also trying to understand some artistic aspects. And I realized that uh, normal questions are not working. So then I searched over the internet and I found out that I have to ask questions like, what do you feel about it when, do you, when you see this color? What is the association and things like this. So I was bombarded with the information. Now you have a background in arts or, or architecture. So uh, can you give us an idea of these questions like reflective questions when we want to analyze the artistic aspect of our game design? Is there any questionnaire available or something? Um, so my, my usual practice for playtesting in that regard, are you talking specifically about like a digital or non-digital game? Um, I guess. Analog games, let's say. Okay, analog games. Um, in terms of playtest, like what I've experienced playtesting analog games has been that, um, I don't know, I guess down to the color theory aspects. Um, I noticed that like when I have draft art or, or no art, the, the players are very confused as to what they're supposed to be doing with different things. And I remember like when I had earlier versions of the artwork on La Mancha before I did, uh, you know, the paintings for it, the, the play testers were kind of confused as to like what, they were asking a lot of questions about like, who is this character? What am I supposed to be thinking about? Um, so for La Mancha, it was a lot of like scene setting and I'm experiencing this right now with like a little prototype for a game that I, uh, want to release in the near future, um, where, you know, I'm playing it with my kids and they're very like confused as the to the difference between each card. Um, so I think, again, my background is mostly in video game development, but what I typically do in video game development is just stay back and observe 
I, I almost wait for the player to get confused. And then once I see that and I lock in on that and say like, Hey, uh, what, what are you thinking about or what are, what's missing from this right now? And then I kind of let them tell me what's going on. Because as you point out, there is a lot of like, you know, it, it can get maddening to be like, is that the right shade of blue um, versus, you know, letting them kind of tell you, I, I'm confused and they might not be able to tell you, I wish this was blue, but you yeah. might then be like, aha, now I know that my, you know, maybe I should have distinct colors or distinct um, artistic graphics or something like that. With, with La Mancha actually, you know, when I did get feedback on the card graphics, it was like, almost I would, I would wait for them to tell me, you know, the, the icon in the corner on this card and the icon in the corner on that card are different. I'm like, oh, they're looking in the corner for the art, uh, for the icon instead of in the, where I placed the icon. So you almost have to meet the players where they are, or what their assumptions are, I guess. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, uh, it, it, of course it is helpful, but um, I think that still there is a need for all of us, um, game designers and everybody to have a, like, let's say sort of basic template, maybe to have some idea about the art, art questions. Yeah. Uh, this is the first thing. Um, actually, we do have some time because um, I couldn't get in touch with the next presenter. So if you want, if anybody wants to ask more questions, uh, please do. So we have some time. So yes, Dr. Brown, you can, unmute yourself. So you were mentioning about kind of the, the principles of the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, what would you say is good about following it? And where would you say are the flaws with not following it? Or is it sometimes good to diverge from it? Um, so I really like that question, because we talk about that a lot in terms of I get, you know, in my what I'm wearing my professional game developer hat, there is a sort of um, there is a, a point about like, are we trying to fit a trend too much and are we going to be really samey or is, or are we hitting this at the right time? And for La Mancha, you know, part of it was really play testing was like, you know, if I play, if I took this to people and they're like, this is cool, but like, I've already got seven of these or something like that, because, you know, this is a popular format and, um, you know, it's probably, it's, I think it's not as big as it was like a few years ago, but, um, you know, so I wanted to watch that reaction first and see if people were like kind of tired of it and kind of over it, but one, they didn't seem to be really that over it, um, which was nice. But then the other aspect of it was, and, um, I didn't get to, you know, talk too much about this. I tried to, to keep uh, going along, uh, you know, the, the uh, wave of the talk or the top of the subject area of the talk, but now I can kind of expand a little bit. Um, one thing that I think really helped La Mancha is that it had that component, but it, it is a role-playing game. Like it is a game where you have a guided role-playing experience, but it is essentially an RPG because you are pretending to be this knight and you are telling what your knight will do um, and, you know, your storytelling with it. So a lot of people who played it who are RPG fans would play it and be like, I can trick my friends into playing role-playing games with me. Um, and I even had a D&D &D player play test the game and was like, I might just buy this for the chivalry card. So if anybody has like writer's block during a D and D session, they'll bust that one out and then turn over a, a chivalry card. And then, you know, there's your, there's your reaction or something like that. So there was, there is an expansion to it that I thought um, in terms of going into a zeitgeist felt, felt okay. Um, so I think it's almost like you want to pick up on trends right now. Like we're doing this a little bit with Nemo we're like, well, how are people feeling about these hand-drawn indie games, right? And, you know, we think they're, people are still feeling pretty good about them because there's not so many of them. Um, but we are watching those trends to be like, you know, 
how much Metroidvania should we put in it? Maybe not all that much. Um, so I, I think again, it's, you put, this is almost like an argument for putting a little bit of your work out there so that you can see what the reaction is. And then if it's positive or if a bunch of people just say like, oh, it just looks like that other thing, then you kind of know it's, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, Christopher, if you are available, maybe um, we, we can take one or two more questions. Are you? Sure, yeah. Okay, um, so do we have any questions from anyone? Then I'll go with my questions. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Christopher, um, first thing is, uh, can you um, tell us how things usually go when you are designing a game um, which is based on a novel or something? Like uh, in terms of law, do we need uh, consent of the people, of the author or of the people who have the copyrights of the novel or something like this? Or we can just read the story and develop the game? Uh, so I, I, I actually gave a whole talk at a, a conference in the spring about this. Um, my, the way I've been doing my work uh, over these last few games is that I don't need to ask permission for Don Quixote because it's a 400 year old, old novel and thus is in the public domain. So that's actually what I, um, and this is actually, this goes into the whole theme of like, let's let's have influence or let's look at the influences of a game in a broad spectrum beyond just other interactivity right um you know i i like when games and i think board games are better that the or tabletop is better at this than video games um but exploring that cultural those cultural references like that aren't just other games and movies and things um so, you know, the public domain is this whole rich landscape of, of material that has a fan base. I mean, if, if we're talking about it in terms of like pure game development, has a fan base. Um, but then for us academics, what's really interesting is then you are then creating a work that adds to the cultural conversation of that work, you know, and that's why when um, I'm actually really glad I get to go into a little bit more of this because this relates to the talk's title. Um, I knew that this couldn't be some sort of cheap reskin of something with Don Quixote. I'm like, if I'm going to succeed in this, it has to meaningfully react to Don Quixote. Um, so I sought the help of people who, you know, like scholars of Cervantes uh, and other things. So. Um, in terms of that, in terms of IP, like, yes, typically you do, you know, I can't make a, uh, Master and Margarita game, um, because from what I understand, uh, Bulgakov's heirs are very, like, fastidious with the IP on that book. Um, so, you know, I would have to avoid something like that unless I do legitimately want to get into the negotiations for something like that. I just, I don't have that level of money <laughs> uh, to be able to do that. But um, yeah, that's, I, I do like working in the public domain though for that reason. So Don Quixote is public domain, uh, Little Nemo is public domain, uh, and, and thus you can freely use that stuff. The, it comes with a risk though, because it, it even, it goes beyond fan base, now you're actually dealing with like often peer reviewed, uh, you know, academic writing about it to, to contend with, which is actually a nice place for us academics. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much. Um, thank you for answering all the questions in detail. And uh, we hope that we will see you again next year. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so the next talk is from Marco. The title of the talk is Board Games and Computational Thinking, How to Identify Games with Potential to Support CT in the Classroom. And the paper is authored by Marco with Andrea Valenti. Marco, are you here? Are you ready?
we need to find Marco. All right, I'm here. Hi, Marco. But, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, just give me a second so I can share my screen. Full screen. There we go. All right, uh, hi everybody. We're a bit, I guess, a bit earlier than than I expected. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, let's just uh, I, I, let me present you our work. Sadly, we we don't actually have a game to show you because we well we didn't make any game. Uh, we just analyzed some games. Uh, but let me just walk you through it, and hopefully you you will see that. Uh, there is a value here in uh, analyzing games for computational creativity, uh, sorry, computational thinking. Uh, and this, uh, this work is uh, by me and Andrea Valente, which is uh, another colleague of mine from uh, uh, Sudansk University. For those of you that are not familiar with Danish, as I guess most of us are, that's the University of Southern Denmark in uh, Uense. Um, and uh, oh yeah, I forgot to introduce myself. I am an assistant professor uh, at this university within this uh, uh, game development and learning technology lab. So first of all, I just want to point. I want to start this by trying to frame why this is interesting, why this is important. Uh, the main reason here is that, uh, as I'm sure, even if you're not a programmer, you might be able to agree, programming is becoming kind of an ever important skill not necessarily the act of programming itself, but at least understanding what is programming, uh, what uh, does it mean to create instructions that a computer can follow, uh, is becoming kind of important. And in fact, in Denmark, uh, we have a, a kind of, uh, like the government is actually going pretty strong on this. It's introducing a new uh, course in primary schools. I can't tell you exactly how it's called because it's in Danish and my Danish pronunciation is horrible. Uh, but uh, uh, basically they're trying to introduce some kind of con uh, extra courses in technology and understanding how technology works because they think it's a critical um, skill for the new generations to learn. So what we're talking here is not exactly programming itself, but it's uh, what's called computational thinking. And uh, that is kind of a new term. It doesn't have a very solid, you know, uh, unified definition yet. But I think all of the definitions kind of agree that it's about being able to express problems and solutions in some way that a computer could execute. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's becoming quite important, at least in Denmark, but I think a lot of countries are kind of pushing towards uh, trying to figure out how to teach this kind of thinking to. Uh, uh, to younger students. And currently, uh, this, is, this is being taught in a lot of different ways, mostly classic lecture exercises, but also some more fun ways that involve some kind of games or puzzles, what we call playful learning. But there is a problem with these uh, fun approaches, and I put the quotes on fun because uh, I think it's sometimes it's debatable how fun they are. Uh, it depends a little bit on how well designed they've actually been. Uh, but uh, one of the problems here is that usually there's only a, sat a static set of challenges. So if you imagine that you're a teacher and you want to introduce uh, some computational thinking concepts to your students, and you take one of these kind of puzzles or gamified, uh, playful learning things, you have kind of a recipe, some kind of let's call them exercise games that people, that the students can follow. But that, that's it. It's only, you know, a static set. Maybe you have a couple of different levels, let's say, but there is nothing that uh, really deals with uh, uh, keeping track of how, what's the level of the students or if some have higher skills than others. And students are generally not really the same. I'm sure you all, if you've taught any class, you can all see that that does happen even at higher educations, but of course it happens also at lower ones. And uh, another problem is that these are generally single use. You use this puzzle, you use this playful learning activity once, and if you try to do it again, 
the students kind of know already how it works and they can't really replay it or try to uh, learn again, uh, learn something more from it. And uh, the problem here again is that if we, if the teacher actually wants to give the students something more or tries to, maybe uh, one of these exercises was not enough to introduce a concept properly, then they kind of have to come up with new ones by themselves. And uh, one of the problems is that, you know, teachers are not necessarily game designers. Uh, it's not easy to be a game designer. And uh, what we're trying to do here, our goal is to, uh, by trying to ident by identifying and analyzing some commercial games that we think are computational thinking relevant, uh, we hope to be able to give teachers a larger pool of games that they can actually you know, go to a store and buy, so it's easier to access uh, and to include in the curriculum. Uh, also give students something that's more fun to play because often these games are not really designed with the, with the objective of teaching anything specific, but they might still include some of these concepts kind of by, uh, as part of the game mechanics that they have. And also it will allow us as researchers to kind of like try to see what key mechanics are related to specific computational thinking topics and maybe use those to create better experiences in the future or at least help uh, teachers, you know, inform their decisions on which kind of games they can use to teach what different kind of concepts. Uh, so let me, before we start talking about the games we have actually analyzed, I just wanted to give you a bit of a state of the art. Uh, so examples of analog games that are, that have been used right now for teaching computational thinking. Uh, this is not exactly games games, uh, but there is this uh, uh, CS Unplugged uh, project where they have a lot of different kind of small activities, sometimes a bit gamified, but uh, uh, they do look a little bit closer to exercises, even if they're kind of playful than games themselves. Uh, and uh, this is all about having these activities that students can do uh, without actually having to use a computer or anything digital. It's all uh, very uh, analog. You can use, they often use also extra material like strings or uh, pens or running around to do things, bits and papers, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, another thing that is more of a commercial nature is this called uh, this thing called Turing tumble? Turing tumble, sorry, uh, which is instead kind of like this uh, uh, analog machine that you build, which is basically a small computer. You can kind of create these uh, uh, these small pro programs that are executed just by gravity and having this ball falling down. So it looks like there is some kind of more push also from a more commercial. Uh, point of view to have these type of uh, gamified learning experiences. But again, this is, uh, this is not really a game by itself. It's more of a physical tool that can be used to understand or try to understand better, play with uh, these concepts. Uh, there's also computer games, of course. Uh, just to give you a few, there is these, uh, this game called Lightbot where you have to kind of program this tiny bot. You can see here, for example, that you have a number of instructions that you can put together uh, so that then the bot will execute your plan. This is kind of uh, common, uh, but we also have other options like RoboCode, where you actually create a more programming-like, in a more programming-like environment, uh, these, uh, um, Let's, let's call them simple AIs uh, for, uh, for these uh, tiny tanks that then they fight against each other. Uh, we also have something uh, like this is more, this is a project from, um, uh, oh, oh boy, now I don't remember the, the name of the university, but uh, it, it's something that, came, that comes from, uh, from research uh, but it's still this type of more 
programming-like structure to create these or these to try to solve small problems that are geared towards uh, teaching computational thinking concepts. And uh, uh, of course, there's also games uh, that are more uh, what I would call programming games. For one example is uh, this game called Shenzhen IO, but there's plenty which are not really geared toward or designed for uh, teaching anything. They're not really uh, uh, thought to be used in the classrooms. There's more for enjoyment and uh, they're kind of a subgenre of games. And these can actually be very, very difficult uh, oftentimes. Uh, but the idea is always that you have to kind of um, program or create some kind of solution to a problem. This can be very creative. There's often a lot of different ways that you can solve problems. Um, and there's plenty of examples of this, but uh, this is just to give you one. Uh, before we move on, I also wanted to point out that if we look at all of these that we've kind of seen, maybe with the exception of some of the, ex uh, of the activities of CS Unplugged, pretty much all of these are single player things, single player games. I think that's actually quite a big problem in uh, teaching, in these activities to teach computational thinking or that have something related to computational thinking because uh, we personally think that the interaction with people is, um, is part of learning or part of enjoying this, kind, this type of experiences. And uh, it seems to us that uh, the idea is that uh, we have this programmer that's sitting behind a computer all alone doing things, uh, creating programs, but that's not actually really reflective of reality. We often, I mean, uh, when we work, um, on programs, we often talk with other people. There's also a technique called like pair programming where we actually uh, code together with someone else. And that seems to not have been explored at all up until now. So that's also why we wanted to look at board games because those are generally uh, much more multiplayer experiences, uh, either cooperative or competitive. So uh, let me introduce you the games that we've looked at. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about them very briefly. Uh, if you're interested in seeing our um, analysis more in depth, you can ask us questions later, or of course, uh, you can also uh, take a look at the paper, but I'll just introduce the games and then try to go to the conclusions and walk you through our process. So we chose six commercial games, then uh, by looking at them, and also some games that were of some, uh, you know, uh, success, at least uh, uh, that they looked pretty successful. Uh, they, some were, uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, and we thought these looked uh, related to uh, computational thinking concepts, either from uh, intuitively looking at the mechanics or from some kind of, uh, uh, from the setting they were trying to, um, they were trying to, uh, express. Uh, and these are mostly pretty different from each other in gameplay and uh, in the, the kind of setting they have. Also, there is another one. Uh, we also included one more game that is instead developed explicitly for teaching computational concepts. So the first one, uh, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with this. This is a pretty old game uh, that's been around for a long time. It's called Robo Rally. Uh, in this game, the players have to kind of guide their uh, robots throughout a map uh, to get to different, uh, um, basically, checkpoints. You can see these flags with one, two, and three are the three checkpoints. And the one that completes the, uh, the course faster is the player that wins. So it's a competitive game with multiplayer. There is also uh, the, the possibility of players uh, um, conflicting with each other within the game world. And we thought this was interesting because we actually have a little bit of kind of programming. Uh, the players work by, or at least move their robots by uh, creating sequences that then are executed as the, when it's their turn. 
the second game we looked at is uh, Twin Tin Bots. This is a very similar game in some ways, in the sense that we still have the setting of some robots being moved around by the players, not directly, but through sequences of actions. Uh, but in this case, they move in to, uh, the goal is to uh, capture some kind of resource in the environment and bring it back to their base. Uh, interestingly for this game, we still have sequences, but uh, each player controls two robots at the same time. If you can see here with the board, with the small board they have in front, uh, these are the actions for the first bot they have and these for the second one, and the bots act at the same time in a parallel. Then we looked at uh, 101, which is kind of a card game, uh, a little bit of, um, I would say, um, like, a, how is it, how is it called, a territory a dominance game. So we have these different rows uh, where players can put these zeros and ones. Uh, zero represents player one, uh, one represents player two. And uh, uh, players, once they have enough, if they have more of their bits in one of the rows, win that row and gain the points that are associated to that row. And th this looked interesting because it does have this very obvious connection with computer games. Uh, it also uses different terms that are uh, very, uh, that are borrowed from programming. We also looked at SET. Uh, this is a pretty cool game uh, that was actually, uh, that actually came to be as a way of uh, finding patterns uh, in, uh, in uh, genomes, if I don't remember wrong. And uh, the set in this case, the game is about making or finding patterns that are like this, where all different, um, uh, sorry, all of the uh, characteristics of the cards, of the three cards are different. So for example, this, this has diamonds, this has these uh, squiggles, and this has these uh, ovals. Uh, they're all different colors, all of different shadings, all of different numbers of symbols. So that's what makes it a set. Uh, we also looked at Quirkle, which is a little bit similar to set in the sense that we need to connect uh, things a little bit domino-like, uh, but with different colors, symbols. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated in that sense. And then we also looked at this game called Space Cadets, uh, which is a much more complicated board game. As you can see, it has a lot of different pieces, a lot of different elements. During the game, there's multiple small mini games that have to be done. Uh, and uh, the game is also cooperative. It's quite, it's quite interesting, but as you can see, it's very complex. And uh, if we look at uh, zoom in of one of these boards, we can see that, for example, here we can see a similar uh, structure as we saw in, uh, in um, um, Robo Rally, where we have to create this kind of sequences to do actions within the game. And finally, as we mentioned, Crafts and Turtles is a set of game, or in reality, it's a more of a, se of a series of uh, uh, gamified class activities that is instead uh, really designed for, uh, for teaching computational thinking. Um, our criticism of this uh, within, the, uh, within the paper is mostly that it doesn't really have a, a very clear game design. It seems very much just class activities with some fun elements attached to that uh, to make it look more fun. It also requires uh, uh, keeping in mind a lot of different rules and uh, requires a kind of a figure of a, of a referee that needs to kind of keep track and uh, of these rules and make sure that everything follows them. So it's a, it's a little bit too complicated and not very well designed from a game point of view. So what did we, uh, after we looked at these games, what did we find? or at least what were we looking at? 
we started by looking at uh, the different concepts that can be uh, uh, that uh, computational thinking uh, is related to. Uh, these are defined over here. You can see them like this. So sequences, for example, is uh, well, as the uh, name says, putting some kind of instruction or is it executing different instructions in sequence uh, loops. Uh, when we have some sequences that have been reproduced over and over again until some conditions met. Parallelism, maybe it's a little bit more unclear what that is, uh, but in this case, uh, parallelism is defined as uh, um, the fact that you can have, let's say, different sequences executing in parallel, just as in, uh, uh, in, in uh, programming we can have different threads uh, different parts of the code that execute at the same time. And uh, the other thing that I think the other, these seem pretty uh, self-explanatory, uh, but data might also be a little bit confusing, so let me just tell you what we mean by that. We mean the storage and the manipulation of information. So if we look at these, we have some plus and some tildes. Uh, for the pluses, when we noticed that there was quite a lot of this concept as being part of the game, uh, while the tilde is when there was something, but it, it wasn't really a core part of the game, or at least it didn't appear very often. So for example, we can see in Robo Rally, sequences play a big part, because as we saw in the, in the image before, basically the game is about building sequences. Uh, when we look at twin tin bots, we still have the sequences since that's how you can uh, create the plans that uh, that your robots execute. But we also have parallelism because the players don't only have to keep in mind uh, about one sequence, but they have to to uh, consider two sequences that are executed in parallel, and so on. And for data, uh, if we look at this, for example, space cadets we consider that has a lot of it. Because if we look at some of the images I have had over here, you can see that we have so many kind of tokens and pieces of information that are uh, shown on the board. And uh, the, way that you, the way that you have to kind of mark the different events or the different things that happen during the game, we kind of define, we kind of see a very, sim a very big similarity between this and how you actually store information within a variable or within a, um, um, a record in, uh, uh, within computers. We did the same with the other part of, let's say, the definition, one of the definitions of uh, computational thinking, which is about the practices. For example, in computational thinking, you have this practice of being incremental and iterative in the creation of your solution, uh, of testing and debugging your solution to figure out what's happening or when something goes wrong, why did it go wrong? Uh, how to reuse and remix different parts or concepts, abstracting, modularizing, and algorithmic thinking. And I think what we really want to highlight here is that it looks like testing and debugging is pretty much non-existing in most of these games that we've looked at. And we have a feeling that it's probably very rare in general in board games because we think it kind of requires you to move out from the game space, from where you are playing, and go to a, a meta level, a more designed space where you have to do some changes. So if you are building a board game, and you are play testing, trying to figure out the quirks or uh, trying to figure out how you to, uh, to make your game as uh, you know, smooth or well designed, then you are doing this kind of meta uh, analysis of your board game while you're playing it. But as a player, normally you don't have, uh, you don't have in mind of how can you change the game, how can you modify the rules. So this doesn't really happen very often. Uh, we also see that instead heuristics and algorithmic thinking kind of happen most of the time because that's how we normally try to think about, uh, like if we need to think a little bit forward, 
we always need to uh, analyze the current situation and try to figure out what is the best moves that we can take. Uh, we can see as an example for SET, this was actually not there because SET is a very reactive game. You just look at some cards that are on the floor and you try to figure out what is, uh, like if you can find one of these sets fast enough. But there is no planning ahead, there's no thinking ahead. So the missing concepts we found was this testing and debugging that is really present. Uh, also loops are very uncommon. Uh, we uh, point out in the paper of uh, a couple of games that seem to use a little bit of the concept of loops, but uh, it's not very common since, uh, for example, if we take Robo Rally, we have these sequences that are made, uh, but once they are made, they are discarded. You execute and you throw them away, uh, which doesn't really allow for this reuse or uh, to create this kind of looping structures. And uh, the last thing we did, and then I hope I'm not running out of time, uh, but then I'll, uh, I'll stop, is that uh, starting from this that I showed you before, we looked at each of these games and uh, found out what kind of uh, uh, game mechanics they were using. We actually took these from Board Game Geek to try to uh, have a more like similar approach to from for all of the different games and then we built a new table i'm sorry i'm showing a lot of tables they're not very pretty uh, but where we try to look at the the concepts of computational thinking against all the different kinds of mechanics this is a redacted table with just the ones that are that we thought were more interesting or that uh, uh, showed up more often, uh, but uh, uh, you can find in the paper the, the complete one. And what we can see here is that some, some of these seems to be uh, pretty related to a lot of different uh, concepts of computational thinking. For example, action cues are of course uh, connected to sequence, but they can also be connected to conditional operators, uh, to incremental, if you have to build your sequence as you continue, to testing and debugging, if you actually have the chance of uh, revising your sequence at some point. Modular, board, uh, modular boards are very nice for uh, representing data and especially uh, for also reusing and remixing since you can take these modules and use them to build, for example, new levels, new challenges. And uh, uh, since we noticed that parallelism was not very common, we actually noticed that in the cases that, we, that they appeared, it was mostly when we had some kind of cooperation and some kind of close to real time um, game mechanics. So not just, not just full turn base, I get my turn, you get your turn. At least a blend of these uh, where the execution of the player's turn happens at the same time or close to the same time uh, needs, to be, needs to be there. Uh, so just to conclude, we try to uh, make, let's say, a checklist uh, for teachers to try to identify uh, computer, computational thinking relevant games. So according to our analysis, ideally, uh, a teacher would have to look for a game that contains some of these features that we found, for example, action cues or cooperation between the players. Uh, and uh, to compensate for the difficulty of covering or maybe supporting this testing and developing practice, uh, sorry, and debugging practice, uh, this optimal game can, could also be presented to the, learn, to the learners uh, as an interactive activity to design this game or to expand on this game for others to play. So basically introducing some kind of game design part uh, within the class. So to conclude, this is kind of an initial analysis on how to identify board games to support computational thinking. Uh, obviously, this is a small study. We only had a, a pretty small amount of games that we looked at. So we should uh, we plan on doing a larger study with more games uh, to get more solid data on this. Uh, but uh, 
And one last thing we want to uh, to want to highlight is that uh, uh, this checklist, these mechanics that look uh, very promising for computational thinking, they can be supported, but they are not necessarily. Uh, so it's always up to uh, to the teacher to kind of do the last step of figuring out is this actually a good game. But we still think that this can help the teachers since there are so many board games uh, available right now. And this would uh, kind of like cut down the, the pool of possible games by a lot. So instead of having to just look at board game geek and seeing like the billions of games that exist, uh, they would they could probably have a short list of uh, uh, 10, 20 games and start from there. All right, thank you very much. That's it for our talk. Uh, my uh, uh, my co-author Andrea is also in the in the room, so he can also answer your questions if you want. Uh, so thanks again. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and thank you both Andre and Marco for the good work. So um, do we have any questions from anyone? Okay, um, I see something in that chat. So there is a question. Marco, can you see the question in the chat or yeah, should I? I, I, can, I can see it. Okay. Probably best uh, just to read it anyways, because then yeah, I'll, it's there I'll for read. the tape. Of course. So the question asks, I wonder if you have some thoughts or experience on games for computational thinking for professionals. Uh, could these games and rules still apply in that setting? Um, so you mean for professionals as adults? Or? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I think that these, these rules that, or uh, you know, this analysis we did with finding these game mechanics that seem to be supportive of different concepts uh, would still apply because that uh, even if our final target is to help teachers in uh, uh, primary schools, uh, this didn't really factor that much within, uh, uh, within this analysis. In fact, I think that maybe some of the games we looked at are not very kid friendly. Uh, if you're, if you remember Space Cadet that I showed before is, you know, like one of these extremely complicated games and probably would not be very fun for, for kids to start playing. It would, since it requires a lot of rule learning. Uh, so I think, yeah, I would say that uh, this analysis would still apply for, uh, for adults. Okay. Um, do we have um, any other questions? Okay, Michael, uh, I, I, yeah. I've got yeah. one, Hannah. Oh, please do. So you were mentioning about debugging and changes during the game. Have you looked into perhaps Flux? Uh, we haven't added that, but uh, I uh, I'm very well aware of Flux. I, it's a game I like a lot. And uh, in that case, I still don't think it, that it fits that much because it's not really a case where you, um, you define some, uh, some of the game rules and then you see how they go and you decide if you, if you need to change them to follow a specific plan. It's more of a iterative process where each player tries to change the rules to fit their own, uh, their own goal. But since it's not really a cooperative pro uh, process, it's more of a competitive one where the same set of rules has changed. I don't know if that counts that much as debugging in a way. Uh, Andrea, are you, uh, do you agree? Yeah, I, I think uh, you say it right, Marco, that, that before that, that basically to have a, a possibility of testing and debugging, you kind of need two spaces you need to have an idea of what you want the system to do, in this case, the computer, for example, or the game. And then when you try out some solutions, you find out that there is a discrepancy between uh, what you wanted and what came out, right? That, then you can formulate an hypothesis why this is wrong, and then go back and change the rules and, and, and try again. So you need this kind of meta level. You need, you need a step uh, back, in a way, from the game. Um, 
So that's, I think that's why we had, we had some problems finding games that really show this kind of thinking. Um, because it, it's not just a matter of like having a, an idea and then trying out something because you do that in games. You, you try to win, you try to beat the other guy, you try to find the resource. Uh, but it's more about uh, like the scientific process. So, so can I actually try out the consequences of something and then maybe they go somewhere else and I, then I have to correct the, 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 the hypothesis and try again. So then you need a game that has steps outside the actual gameplay where you can reformulate and then play again, right? So, so that's a bit more complicated. I don't even know if it makes that much sense in a, in a, in a fun situation. Uh, it's very typical of, of complicated uh, engineering scenario where you build something and then you want to evaluate alternatives, right? Design does that a lot, uh, but they are not games normally. So you do it for other reasons. There is a goal-oriented uh, uh, way of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, Antonio's also has a question for Marco and Andrea. Yeah, Antonio's. Hi, Marco. Hi, Andrea. Uh, it's just a follow-up to what you said. I mean, I would contend that um, some of these games, for example, Robo Rally, you do resolve, you do your action planning and then you resolve it. So you can basically see the, the effect of your actions. And uh, another example that came to mind, uh, you already tweeted about, is Space Alert, where you're making something, you're mm -hmm. trying to solve a training simulation and you actually play it uh, moment by moment. You know, you play the actions of all the players at the same time and you figure out what went wrong. So yes, you do not necessarily redo it. Like, you know, you don't refine yeah. it, which was, was what you would do when programming, but it does have that feel. Like mm -hmm. it does compile essentially. Yeah, if I can maybe answer. But in fact, if you look at the tables that we have, we say that sometimes you have a bit of that, right? So we're not saying that it's completely absent, but, but as you say, it looks like, and definitely is connected to some forms of iteration. Mm -hmm. So, because again, also in, in the design cycle, you, you, you do something and then you test it out, you evaluate it, and then you, you try again, right? So, so you have this kind of reassessment of, of, your, of your solutions, uh, which is possible in these games. Uh, it's just not that present. And, and it's one of the things that is mostly missing. So we were, we were surprised in a way, right? Um, uh, because as you say, uh, if, if you are planning a game, if you are designing some kind of games, inside the game, then it can really happen, but that is not your normal game. It's, it's already kind of a complicated or, or, or a bit more, uh, I don't know, chop it down. The action has to be chopped into pieces because then you have a phase where you kind of design something and then a phase where you try it out, I think. I don't know if you, if, if you agree, Marco, but, you know, so no, we have it sometimes, but it, it's just not one of the most present things. Um, so we have to compensate, I think. I mean, a design idea, since we're just brainstorming now, sorry, you, you can stop me from, from talking, but um, you could actually make macro actions that you can then use, and then you could essentially re redesign your macro actions if they don't work. So that could be a way of, you know, like you pick up a piece, and then if you don't pick it up, then you can refine it. Yeah. Mm. Possible design idea there. Yeah. Yeah, it depends. I think it depends how much control you want to have on the game. So the games where you kind of sit back and let some of the role of the, of the game play by itself, then you might have some of this because you can adjust, right? So as I think Marco was, was showing, when you are controlling another element, but if you are playing first person, let's say, then it's probably more difficult, I think. Yeah. yeah um, anyone else would like to know something? Okay, Marco, I have um, one or two comments slash questions. So uh, the first thing is, I know that uh, you have uh, sort of like two set of games, um, one that are explicitly designed to establish computational thinking or to invoke computational thinking in the classroom. So of course, they are being used in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But then you have some other games that can potentially do the same work. Uh, do you have any information on statistics that if teachers are using those other games which are not designed specifically for computational thinking like um, for the students and they are being used for this purpose. Do you have any information about the statistics? If this is being uh, I think Andrea is more uh, suited to answer this. Is more is his expertise. 
Yeah, yeah, we, we have cooperated with some local schools. So at least I know what they are doing in Denmark, right? And, and a very typical situation in, in Denmark is that uh, when they introduce uh, in primary school, they introduce some programming or, or, or this, uh, this computational understanding, uh, as they call it, right? Uh, they, they use any kind of tools. It doesn't have to be a programming language. So a typical one is, is Minecraft. So they are using Minecraft. Uh, so the kids start playing in, inside of the environment and eventually they, they get given some tasks about building something cooperatively or counting some kind of structures in 3D they are building. So, so there are some physical, let's say virtually physical uh, uh, things that you have to do in the game. Um, and then later you can add, uh, you can switch to a Minecraft version that has blocks that are programmable. So you can actually do a bit of programming with it, right? Um, but, but that was interesting because they started doing that even before that. So at least five years ago, there were already some schools that were using things like Minecraft just to play around. So, so you could have the kids joining together. Uh, there was a project I remember from someone in Australia. So they had Australian, I think it was Italian kids. They were connecting together in the same sp uh, spot inside of Minecraft and then remotely play together. So they had to chat. Uh, I think the point was that one class was learning Italian, the other class was learning English. So then they could have a place to exchange some ideas. Okay, that's not computational thinking, but it is still just a digital platform in a way, right? Um, so you can reappropriate these things. And especially before there was, uh, uh, let's say, specific things, you had to do that because there was nothing available, right? Um, so teachers are used to kind of uh, take whatever they can from, from other systems. Uh, there are systems that they use, they use in, in some schools, for example, um, there, are, uh, there are some websites where you can make your own comic book. That is not really programming, but it is an expression, creativity uh, with digital means. Uh, so, so that has been used as well. So there are teachers saying, okay, uh, we are studying German today, maybe try to do something uh, like a comic book in German and then make it a bit interactive so you can click and it, it continues and whatever, right? Um, put some audio there. So that, that they do this kind of activities uh, already, right? But that is not a game and it's not meant for that. They just stretch it until it fits in a way, right? Um, yeah. So that, that's very much the situation. I think that's also why with Marco we were saying, maybe these guys, they need a hand to kind of select something a bit more uh, appropriate or, or do less work in finding new tools, right? Um, because the market is still emerging in a way, so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one more thing, is this like, do we have a superset of all the mechanisms or features that can potentially do um, or establish computational thinking among students? Like we have like, so the game should have incremental features, um, reusing, abstracting, which is in the slide. Is this pretty much the superset or are we lacking something? I think that uh, this is what we built from our analysis, but as we mentioned, this is an analysis of uh, uh, just quite a few games. So we, we can say for sure that, you know, these are the ones, these are the best kind of uh, uh, mechanics to use for this. Uh, we would need to do a lot more analysis on that. And uh, I, I also want to uh, hi like, uh, highlight again that uh, we did notice that you know some of these games we looked at have some of these mechanics that look to be supportive, but they are not always supportive. In some cases, we find that the mechanic is there, but it does not support computational thinking. It depends on how the mechanic is used within the framework of the game. So I, I don't think we, we can find probably even with a larger analysis, you know, like a final solution. This is the best perfect game for this. Yeah, uh, it's more. It's gonna be more of a. These type of uh, mechanics probably mean that the game could be supportive. Mm. It could be a very good game for this, but then there is no hundred percent, you know, guarantee on that. I agree, um, but uh, actually, uh, because of your work, uh, we still have a very good starting point. If we want to include games to uh, support or to involve computational thinking among our students. So you have, so. Us, yeah, you have given us a good, uh, you know, structure to start looking into this. Um, uh, do you. we have any more questions for Marco and Andrea? I think we do not. So I would like to thank Marco and Andrea. Thank you very much.
for the presentation, for your good work, and I hope I will see you again in the uh, first uh, in the discussion session and then next year also. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, um, we are still waiting for one of our presenters to log in because they are having some technical issues. So um, I can use this time to talk about uh, the research of one of the presenters who is actually, I could just couldn't get in touch with him, but I still feel that um, I should introduce his work because um, not just it's a good work, but it's a very kind work. Um, uh, the presenter is Winnie Montage from um, University Goldsmiths University, and I think it's in UK, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, uh, Winnie has developed a game. It's called Refugee, um, and what does the game do? The player is like a refugee. Um, in the game and the player is experiencing all the things uh, which refugees are experiencing when they are um, migrating uh, from one country to the other. And uh, I will say that uh, this paper, when I read, it was like very eye-opening. I am aware of usually like, I'm aware of some things uh, uh, that happen uh, during this process and with refugees, but I just couldn't imagine that those things are to really another level and they are really disastrous. So um, whatever I remember from the paper, I cannot explain as good as uh, Winnie, but I will just um, speak a little bit more about what I um, what was very eye-opening. So refugees, when um, in the game, it is based on uh, monopoly mechanics. Uh, the player is a refugee and they start from the point um, at which refugees are usually starting. So they have to pay some money to the mafia. The money is like a really high amount. It, it is $10,000 or British pounds. I don't remember the currency, but still uh, it was a very high amount. So first they have to pay the money to the mafia and then the player, they could they go to the next step because, um, and things can happen in between too, even when they have paid, um, people can just take their money and um, never respond. So then the game proceeds. Um, if the refugee is successful in, or the player is successful in passing this step, they, are, they have given the money and now they can enter another country through the border, then they have other difficulties waiting for them. So the game gives us a very good idea of this journey. And um, of course, for the player, it's, a, it's an emotional journey too, because they are really experiencing what refugees experience. So this was a little bit of an introduction of Winnie's work. If you get a chance to read his paper, please do. And um, now I am just waiting for Luis, who is the presenter, to join in. Let's see. So um, Louis is still trying, maybe uh, we can proceed to our next discussion session. And when Louis joins in, we will see how things go. Okay, so there is a Google document um, in the chat, a link to a Google document, please have a look. And what we have to do. So we have some um, topic ideas uh, in this Google document. We can discuss these um, plus um,
Okay, uh, something else I would like to mention, but I'm not aware of all the details. Dr. Brown knows the details, but I will just still mention it, that uh, we are looking um, to, um, um, we are thinking of um, editing a book actually. And um, the idea was that if um, authors are fine with this, maybe we can propose these papers, which will be published in the workshop and uh, for the book. So let us know what do you think about it. And if you have any other ideas um, or any other research papers that you think can be a good um, addition to the book, please do let us know. We haven't decided the exact, uh, like exact, exact topic, but probably it will be um, on analog games research. Christopher, you mean with the book? I, I got your message, but uh, yeah, perfect then. So, um, once we will have uh, more details, we will share these details with all of you. And let's see, maybe it will be a very good book. I, I'm sure it will be a very good book. Okay, so. Perfect, Marco, thank you. Dr. Brown, if you can hear me, I'm just waiting for Louis. Yeah, so I, th I think sadly we're heading to the end of our time and I know that there's also the UX in AI group that would like to have their uh, their session start on time. So I think for now what we'll do is just say thank you to everybody who joined us today and that could uh, come. And we'll end the session, I guess, here. And hopefully, we will continue to talk about all of these issues inside of tabletop games to go forward and hopefully in person soon enough. And uh, please keep in uh, contact. I know the FDG has a Discord about this, and we can talk about things there. Yeah, so thank you very much. and. Um... So please stay in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.